I'm gonna have the mic for a second on the outside. I don't think you'll be able to see it while he's back here. My name is, in Willingboro, my name is David Bradley. I grew up in Pennypacker Park. In the entertainment industry, everybody knows me as D. Brad. But my name is David K. Farrell. But then again, tomorrow, y'all may see me, I may say something else different, because that's just how I get down. This is how I do. Because, you know, we black, we melanated people, see? We, we are undefined and uncontrollable. And just to go off on a little tangent, I think my own opinion is that's what gets us as black folks caught up in trouble, because we keep trying to define ourselves, and especially defining ourselves based off the construct of someone else who is attempting to be us. All right, now, I have a documentary called Confessions of a BET Producer. So I always like to, if I'm going to name what I do, it's called Confessions of a BET Producer. And what I'm going to do is keep this really short and in the capsule, because I love listening to my man Black Dot, what he brings to the table. I'm just a dude that actually put a lot of this work into plan. I started interning at MTV in 1997 through 98. And this was in 19, yeah, 19, I think about 1998 actually is when I had my major first experience. Every day all the white people at MTV would sit around between the hours of 3.30 and 5 o'clock and watch BET. Finally one day I walked up to him, I said, hey, I don't even watch BET. Why are y'all sitting around watching this? Every white person turned and looked at me and said, hey, this is how we tell what black America is watching, what black America is doing. So, so, and, I, and I watched this go on for the whole semester. Every day like clockwork, it'd be 20 some odd white people sitting around one television watching Rap City, watching a little bit of Video Soul, then they would go about their business. Well, fortunately for me, the next year, I was hired right out of college to work um, at BET on a show called By the Book. And I brought that technology with me over to the black television station. And um, to make a long story short, just to throw, run down my resume really quickly, I created this show called Spring Bling. Um, artists like Eve, I put Eve, I helped create that image that we see of her now. Um, even after I left BET, I was Dave Chappelle standing. So I saw everything that happened with him. And to, make, and, and to really capsulize it even more, basically, since 1997, whatever has happened in urban America as far as the perception on television and film, I was basically the fly on the wall. That's why this brother is so correct. Oh, there you go, was so correct when he says we are at war. And I know it's somewhat difficult to believe that a war can be anything other than physical, but it is. This is why the civil rights techniques don't work anymore. This is why black people march and it gets no real headway. Because believe you me, that Genesis march meant nothing. They were going to let that dude out anyway. As a matter of fact, they didn't even let him out when they marched. They let him out a week or so later. You know, even a lot of these groups now that protest BET, what they have to understand is this was a plan. And how do I know? Because I was a part of it. I helped implement this plan. It's just at the time, I was naive. I didn't know. To me, it was just, I grew up in the golden age of hip hop. So to tell me, you pay me 200, 250 a day, sit around and talk about rap music, listen to rap music, hang out with rappers, well hell, I'd have done that for free. So for me and the fellas around me, it was all fun, but we did not know that we were a part of a system. And my vice president would always tell me, he would always pull me out from the bunch and say, D. Brad, look at the big picture. I thought the big picture was black America. I had no idea that the big picture was being a part of this system. Because it's not even really about color per se. It's not even really about the white boy hates black people. Because the average white person is just ignorant, and even more ignorant than the average we think the average black person is. Because they really believe that foolishness. They, they don't have anything to show them that they're superior. So whereas black people that believe that decadence, sometimes we look out in the street, sometimes you have to ask yourself, do we really come from Egyptians with the way that, that black folks be acting? So I can understand that. But that's the, that's the one thing we need to understand, that this is more of a war on black people because of perception. This man has to write himself into world history. Like, like everything we do today, we read the Bibles, the Qurans, whatever we read, that's re religious text. If you have any common sense, you know that you're reading about black people. No one should have to tell you that. We, we're reading about black people. Well, this age is over. This life cycle is done. And when the new one starts, what has to happen is he has to write himself into the history of the world. And how he does it is visually. See, our parents, our ancestors wrote in walls and wrote in stone. The white boy uses film, television, DVDs, CDs. They don't use records anymore, none of that stuff. You understand? They use, what, they use visual implementation 
of a certain psyche. So when you wonder why you see so many young black gay males today, it's because it's, source, it's literally sorcery that's done. And how do I know? Because I did it, but I did it from a different perspective. When I first put um, Eve on television, it took her out of the Rough Riders jersey and, and, and all the, the, the rough tomboyish attire. I made everyone think that she was talented. I made the viewing public think Eve was viable, but we all know Eve is not a great rapper. She's not a great actress, none of that. But somehow she became a star, why? Because the people believed it because I knew from what I was watching the white people do on MTV that people believe what they see on television. There's even a commercial on right now that they basically tell you the trickery that goes on. My man is um, in semi, what's the film, semi-pro, Will Ferrell, listen to his deodorant commercial and what he says. This is what is done in television and film. He tells you that something about 300 uh, sweat glands or pores, he said, I don't know if that's the actual fact. But then uh, 30 seconds later, he tells you, but use this deodorant and you'll close all the 300 pores and that's a fact. You understand? And I've watched, I've, a lot of black folks don't want, also don't want to believe that yes, there is a room of people that sit and conspire. And then once again, how do I know? Because I was sitting in the room half the time. And some of the stuff that I would hear these black folks say would, be like, would blow my mind. Yes, I have heard BT executives say that the BT audience is not that intelligent. Right in my face. Intelligent. Right in my face. Um, one, of the mo one of the glaring examples I use is that um, there's a brother named Cousin Jeff. On, um, he's the conscious, the resident conscious black man on BET. He did a week-long series on the word nigger and how it was just derogatory ABC and D. I happened to watch, and I cannot recall the brother's name, and I love giving him credit. It was a documentary called Africans in Asia. Do you know the brother's name? Eugene Adams. Eugene Adams. I think everybody black should watch Africans in Asia. I stepped to this brother. I'm like, yo, I'm like a born again Christian. Yo, Jeff, I got the, 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 the black people that are not really, and niggas don't really mean ignorant, this, that, and the other. Jeff looked me up and down. He said, D Brad, I know that. I said, well, dog, you just did a whole series about, about the word being, being ignorant. He said, ah, yeah, but black America's not ready for that yet. You understand? I even. What happens in television and film that we all rely on so much is that those in power know that if they attack our five senses, our five carnal senses, and which basically all lead to some form of physical pleasure. We get off work, we tie. So I'm gonna turn on reality television, which ain't reality because I worked on the number one reality show in America for two straight years, and I know for a fact that there were plenty of times they said, okay, cut that. Now, when you come up this time, act like you didn't see the car. I've, I've shot it, I've sat there and watched. You know, so it's not even reality television, but they understand that majority of us, whether we like it or not, are lazy as hell on a spiritual level. We think because we work three jobs that now nah, I'm not lazy, but spiritually, psychologically, the masses are lazy. And it ain't just a black thing. It's just that the reason why black America gets it is because we are the beginning and the end. So therefore, we are all that, that everything encompasses. So a majority of the decadence we see, we had to give the white boy permission to do it. Because they're not even from the studies that I've done, just being in such an infrastructure like BET, and I still work in the film and television industry, and I have actors that we see on TV every day that are my friends, and I'm in their homes, and I know that they ain't got no money. I've been over rappers' cribs that will go on MTV cribs talking crazy, and I've been in the house like, where? You living a little bit better than me. Because it's all based off perception. Even going back to what, uh, what the brother talked about with the homosexuality, with the rap, here's the kicker. It's not that. The rappers are gay. That's not it. That's a misconception. What it is, it's about control. See, these, that's what makes it, that's why you see so many buffoons nowadays in television and film doing things that we know are like, wow, Jamie Foxx, you would say that? Wow, Jay-Z, you would actually sit there and do an anti-Semitic commercial? Because they're in a bind, because see, Jay-Z's not gay. I'll use him as an example. He's not gay. But within, once you reach a certain level within that weapon of mass destruction, you have to give something up. There's something that you're going to give up because you've got to be down with that crew. Now, how do I know? 
because it happened to me. That is why I'm standing here talking right now. I reached a certain level at the, in that station. I was the only producer to ever come as a new kid and create a multi-million dollar revenue generating show. I was the only producer in there that artists would come and be like, oh, I need D. Brad to do my show, or that, that actually helped create an image for artists. So it reached a certain point where now it's time for them to introduce me to the inner workings of this, of this monster that's, that's created. And that's why nowadays we see people caught up on secret societies, but it ain't no secret if everybody's talking about it. You know, and everybody talks about the skull and bones, A, B, C, and D, because that's old news. You feel what I'm saying? What is, what's happened is it was passed down to, the urban, the, to everyone in the urban industry. So now you have a, a, a rapper who will get turned out by a high-ranking label exec because, well, what you gonna do? I mean, if I want, if I want to be a rapper and I walk in the, in the the label exec tells me that this is what I need to do for him because hey, he put my album on when I really wasn't that talented. But they pushed me because they saw that I was something that they could sell. So when you bring me in a room and there's my favorite rapper right there who's in the same room, so that must mean he must have committed the same gay act as I did. So at the end of the day, depending on what, where your level is within yourself, you go do it. And it's easy for those of us to sit back and say you wouldn't do it. But the majority of us, and I know it's going to be kind of harsh, but the majority of us will never fulfill our dreams. So we'll never be in a position to say what we would or would not do. You understand what I'm saying? We'll never be in that position. Because before I got there, I would say the same thing until I got there. You understand? So I literally lived with the devil taking me up the mountain and saying, you can go to the left, you can have all of this. And it was, I was there. I was, they, it was ritualistically done. The, the vice president sent his right-hand man to me three straight weekends. They do everything in threes. Three weekends in a row. Hey, D. Brad, let's go hang out. And every weekend, he kept beating me in the head. Get rid of this Rap City, man. You can do more than Rap City, D. Brad. You can do more than you. You need to come with us. Then the third night, it was the vice president's birthday. They picked me up in a long, white stretch limo. We go to Joe's Uptown, up in the Bronx in New York. We go to Joey hanging in VIP. Get me everything I want. Then every time we hung out, it was the same way. Then they bring me to the back, back room. And in the back room, they had this long table with a white sheet set out. I mean, beautiful thing. Looked like the damn Last Supper. On one end is Derek Jeter, there's Stephon Marbury, there's Fat Joe, and I'm chilling. But the whole night, the vice president is on me like this. I'm trying to talk to the model chicks. He's like, nah, D. Brad, come on, sit right here. So then we party, but I'm not a drinker. So if I don't get unnecessary spirits inside of me. We get inside the limo, he, he drops his right hand man off Quickly, we're in the car, the man standing across looking at me like I owe him something now. And I know the look because when I was young, I had the same look for, for women that I took out. So I know the look and I know the energy. And while he's doing that, he's sitting there with his legs spread open, rubbing his balls. Now I'm in a situation where I'm like, no, what am I going to do? This is my vice president, this is my boss. But the problem is, I was just raised differently. You understand what I'm saying? I was brought up differently. So for me, I had to turn that away. But what the hell that I caught after that, this is why I don't come down on those who buffoon to sell out because everybody ain't built for this war. Everybody's not built for that. I've been homeless. I've had my name destroyed. You know I've had to walk with my head up when I've been dead ass broke. He ain't seen me for like a year because I wasn't coming home when I was broke like that. I was ashamed of myself. I went from being a man to nothing because I would not cross over. You feel what I'm saying? So. That's what I want to get out the way in the beginning, because we come down hard on people. But if you've never been there, I went from making 100000 a year with no kids to making nothing. You understand? To, to work at minimum wage jobs. So the reality of it all is, it's tough. And we are in a psychological war. And that's what, telev and that's what television is. That's the weapon of mass destruction, is television. And everyone knows that. Why? Because where do we get the term weapon of mass destruction from? Television. So like my man said, really the reality of it is, I'm going to drop it at this because I love listening to Black Dots, so I'm being selfish, y'all. But the reality of it all is, is this, as a television producer who was Dave Chappelle standing, which means I did his rehearsals season one or two of Chappelle's show, I saw what happened to Dave. Dave used to give me advice all the time. And one of the key things he told me was, no matter how much money they offer you, and he said they, as he pointed in my chest, he said never forget who you are or where you come from. And he walked away from me. And I didn't get it at the time until the nigga left. Then I said, oh. And him and Charlie Murphy would tell me the same things all the time. And then I got it. This is a war. And there is these cats are sorcerers. And we need to take, and I know the words magic and sorcery takes people to make you think that I'm talking about the Eastwick Chronicles or, or Harry Potter. But this is real. Because it's affecting our babies. So when they see all these signs visually that say 
75% uh, of the new HIV cases in New York are blacks and Latinos, it gives them the impression that everybody black and Latino got, is HIV positive, had AIDS. And I tell people all the time, I'm 35, I ain't never been to an AIDS funeral. So right, right, right there, that, that statistic has to drop. And I don't even know nobody in the last 10 years has been to an AIDS funeral in my personal life. So according to the statistics, we all should be dead. Shouldn't nobody be sitting here. <laughs> You understand? I, I had a young sister trying to force for me this AIDS. If I said, yo, you work for the class, I said, let me ask you a question. How old are you? She said, I'm 24. I said, when's the last AIDS funeral you've been to? She was like, oh, I've never been to one. I said, what the hell are you handing me this flyer for? <laughs> well, you understand? So this is all, it's wordplay. And that's why I love how my man brought it in because it's the truth. And he makes my job easier because easier I ain't got to talk a whole lot. That this is sorcery. So the bottom line is, people are going to call you a hater. They're going to say, oh, you're always playing devil's advocate. But I'm suggesting everything you see on television and you read and you hear, on that radio, hate on it. And the, and, the, and the purpose of knowing about Jay-Z and a lot of these rap artists in the secret societies is not really to obsess over it because the magical way to, to dead all of that is to ignore it. It doesn't exist. Like I have a saying, to me, pigs, cops don't exist. Because when I see a pig, I see a person. I don't see a cop. And then that's if I even look at them. I've done crazy stuff in front of cops in New York and walk right on past and watch them get someone else because they don't exist. So therefore, that's how you counteract the magic. You understand? And then one last point I want to make, that one of the biggest things black folks need to realize too, I think it's, it's, it's past the age of keep, to keep looking at the white boy. What's holding black people back is there's a small group of black people in America that have all the money, that have all the power. I don't mean that are rich. I'm talking about the wealthy. There's a big difference. They have all the money and the power that control everything as far as when it hits the black community. And they're called the boule and uh, Brother um, Steve Coakley is where, I got, is where I got a lot of my research from, and as well as my brother Bobby Hemmett and Dad Gorn, I forget my man's name who wrote it. And, what, and say this name for me. Again. There we go, my man too. There, and, and understand, it ain't just, and now it's going, and it start, a lot of it started, I think it was May 1st, 1904, I think, was the first, what it was, it was called, what is it called, side, whatever, some, whatever. Look it up. Sigma, whatever, exactly. And it, ex exactly, and extended to this day, and I think W.E.B. Du Bois brought a lot on it when he had his talented 10th theory, because he was adamantly against what um, Marcus Garvey was talking about. When Marcus was like, let's get up out of here and go back to Africa. You know, so what happens is, in this day and age, we have a new kind of boule, because even a lot of these boule members that were in control went to Ivy League schools. Well, I'm gonna hit you with this. The CEO of BET and the vice president that I had my running both graduated from Brown University. So that, I, that said it all. When I found out, I said, well, damn, no wonder. You understand? And the boule ain't really just all about those people that have a lot of money or that are the educated blacks. Like, to, in my humble opinion, I say someone like Frank Lucas. Now I'm looking in the camera. Like Frank Lucas, who they made this American gangster film, is boule. Why? Because there's a difference between Nicky Barnes and Frank Lucas. Nicky Barnes really actually sold drugs in the context of what we think a drug dealer would do. I go to the house in Miami and I meet with Pablo or I'm on the corner in the back of some building. Meanwhile, Frank Lucas sat in a building with probably no windows with three white boys talking about what they were going to bring into this country. Big difference. And that is what hinders us a lot. So every time Bill Cosby gets up and says something negative about black folks, boule. Every time Oprah Winfrey says, oh, I'm going to open up a school in South Africa and these kids in Chicago are crazy, boule. You understand what I'm saying? With all of this stuff we need to look into. Politics as well. Barack Obama's damn related to Dick Cheney, which is crazy because I say to black people, they act like, so what? Which is amazing to me. So I'm not really into politics, but I'm into WWE wrestling, which is pretty much the same thing. <laughs> Batista, Undertaker, you know, Clinton, Barack Obama, yeah, it's all the same thing. So the reality of it is, is that whatever's being given, hate on it. I encourage people in 2008 to hate Hate everything. If I give hate on what I'm saying, hate, be selfish, be angry. People say, oh, don't be angry, don't be mad. Why? Be, I encourage anger. I'm an angry mother. I'm an angry guy sometimes. You understand? And I encourage that because when you get angry, you're going to move on it. When you really get tired of having to go to work 9 to 5 every day, you're going to start to question things. When you really get tired of paying them taxes, you're going to start to be like, why am I paying these taxes? Because really, according to their they, they constitution, all the only people that got to pay taxes in this country is a, a state lawman, a, a congressman, and all that. So it ain't really us. So when we get tired of it, and that's why I encourage people, get angry. I think anger is a wonderful thing. I wake up angry sometimes, but I feel great. 
and I ain't gray. My skin ain't all messed up. So don't tell me that 